Hello and welcome to our next episode of Medical Education on COVID-19. I am Dr. Imjad Hussain from Pakistan and today we are going to talk about a very intense topic. It's about the molecular genetics and structural details of coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2. I'm going to dedicate this talk to the loving memory of my father who had always inspired me a penchant for learning and teaching and he has always been a great teacher and learner in himself. So today's uh, talk is about uh, about the SARS coronavirus uh, 2 actually and we'll be briefly touching some aspects of SARS coronavirus 1, the classical SARS CoV-1. So let's start today with a uh, uh, brief snapshot of what are viruses and their relevance to our lives. What viruses actually do to us and why are they here for? So as we know viruses have been here for around ages. They have been here for eons, for decades, for centuries and probably they have been here before us. And it's a new knowledge to me that uh, viruses are even incorporated uh, in our human genome and they make about 8% of the human genome. So viruses are not something that we have never known before. We have been always uh, having our battles and our skirmishes with viruses. And this uh, virus uh, is is a kind of new, uh, new in the sense uh, uh, that it has acquired some features that were not seen before in previous corona families. So coronaviruses are basically, uh, there has been seven human coronaviruses and, out, uh, and these are subdivided into four genres actually, alpha, beta, gamma and delta coronaviruses. And as we know, coronaviruses are abundant in animals and animals, especially bats, are reservoir for coronaviruses. In bats, uh, it has been seen that uh, uh, there are around 500 to 5000 types of uh, coronaviruses. And fortunately, not all of them, not all of the strains of coronaviruses, they have been able to jump upon human being. And as we have seen, there, have, there has always been an intermediate host uh, before a zoonotic virus is successfully able to jump upon or what we call the spillover effect uh, in human population upon human race. So in terms of uh, 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 the types of coronaviruses that have been uh, seen to be causing disease among human. We have said there are four uh, coronaviruses and uh, these four coronaviruses are actually, uh, they have been able to cause uh, flu symptoms and common flu. Uh, and around 30% or 20 to 30% of the flu is caused by these four coronaviruses and these are human coronavirus NL63, human coronavirus 229E, human coronavirus 43, and human coronavirus HKU1. And in addition to that, there have been three more potentially serious uh, diseases that were caused by three different viruses. So in total, there are seven coronaviruses that have been known to human beings and that have been seen to cause disease among humans. And the latest one is SARS-CoV-2 and before that uh, there have been an epidemic with uh, another coronavirus that uh, that was called MERS virus, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome in 2012 and before 2012 there have been uh, the classical SARS coronavirus uh, that was called coronavirus 1 because of uh, its uh, striking resemblance to coronavirus 2. Uh, to the novel coronavirus actually and that caused uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome in 2002 and 2004. So 
Uh, fortunately, all of these viruses we have seen that they belong to alpha and beta uh, genre of uh, the uh, coronavirus family that is from actually the Nilovirae that is actually uh, the species name or genus name for uh, this whole family. Gamma and Delta coronaviruses have never been able to cause disease in a human being. So far it has not been seen, but they are successful in causing disease among birds and animals. So in some ways, uh, virus do find a way of uh, jumping from animal reservoirs to humans and there is a there has always been an intermediate host uh, and in case of uh, coronavirus 1 that intermediate host uh, was identified and it was actually civet cats and civet cats are actually culled and that's how they were sacrificed and that's how the disease was contained but for the sake of uh, coronavirus 2 uh, the intermediate host uh, is not yet confirmed. There has been um, speculation about uh, animals like uh, snake and pangolin, but we are not sure. So the difference between coronavirus 1 and 2 is uh, coronavirus 1 has been able to successfully uh, create clusters in hospital. So in a way it was uh, contained with the help of public health measures, especially in terms of uh, nursing care and healthcare uh, staff uh, hygiene. And the coronavirus 2 uh, is different from coronavirus 1 in terms of its potential for community transmission. It has been able to successfully create large clusters of uh, in population and as we have seen the recent epidemic of COVID-19 is, uh, is going to a, a high figure of uh, almost infecting more than 230 or 240 countries of the world and it has infected uh, around the figure of 100,000, 10 lakh people and the death rate from uh, this, uh, uh, this scourge is uh, uh, around uh, more than 50,000 deaths so far. So it's devastating in terms of its infectivity and uh, its death rate and uh, spread of uh, spread of infection, the successful way it's spreading from countries to countries. And uh, the third difference among coronavirus 1 and coronavirus 2 is that the coronavirus 1 has uh, not, uh, that was not seen to have asymptomatic transmission. And so there was there wasn't much, uh, there. actually there was a role of contact tracing in that and contact tracing actually played an uh, uh, amazing role. And in terms of coronavirus 2, it's actually from data it has been seen that large population of people is uh, actually, they carry disease and they communicate disease. So it's largely asymptomatic spread and pre-symptomatic spread. Around 50% of the spread from Wuhan, China, epidemic uh, was believed to be asymptomatic before anyone could have developed symptoms the virus uh, has been uh, the virus has been spread to other people so uh, probably that's the main reason for creating uh, large large clusters and such uh, rapid spread of this virus just like a wildfire so let's talk about uh, viruses for a while uh, in general what do viruses do for us and what do they do for a living? So viruses, as I have already said, have uh, they make 7 to 8 percent of human genome population. So we are carrying viruses for centuries and we never know. They are incorporated in our genome and they do uh, displaying thing. They, they, do, they do display amazing things. For example, they have the uh, amazing microeconomic skills uh, through keeping small efficient DNA or RNA sequences and even some of them have positive sense uh, sequences like uh, this coronavirus 2 and that uh, gives it the efficiency to be translated uh, and latched upon right away to ribosomal part of RNA and that adds to its, its expediency and uh, viruses uh, they have uh, also seen to be uh, integrating with, hum uh, with human cell, cell genetics and altering 
genetic expression of human cell and they do add to that uh, degradable pool of uh, RNA um, and that's how they change the face of uh, expression of diseases and there have been a lot of implication of viruses and they like um, from cancer genetics it has been seen that a uh, lot of uh, proton genes uh, like retinoblastoma and p53 viruses do have a potential of interfering with them and probably causing many 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 cancers and they're also used uh, in development of vaccines so they are integral part of us and we really don't know if uh, we could live without them or but for sure viruses cannot live without a host in general they, they basically they do not have identity even viruses uh, they, they have a capsule or capsid uh, that kind of protects them protects this uh, uh, genetic material that basically it's another theory like uh, that uh, genetic material of these viruses the DNA RNA bases or uh, base pair uh, it's actually it's, uh, it's actually the excreta of cells from plant, animal and human and there has been an evolving discussion on the radiation hazard of uh, radiation hazard of causing uh, such diseases and evolution of viruses in causing pandemics uh, there it talks about it and a lot of people are studying about this uh, 5G stuff and basically microwaving of this planet called Earth. So let's move on to our topic of uh, uh, molecular biology and structure of viruses. So I'm going to put on a few slides for you. And actually these, uh, these slides and this lecture is an inspiration from lecture of uh, Dr. Britt Glassinger, she's a PhD and professor from University of Berkeley and I have been reading and studying part of uh, detail in cellular biology of this virus from uh, this site, uh, Innovative Genomic Institute, iBiology and some others. So uh, let's uh, uh, move on to structure of virus here. So, uh, this is a pleomorphic particle of 125 nanometer with a helical nucleocapsid and the images you will really see in our cryo-electron microscopic pictures that shows a huge positive, positive sense RNA and that is surrounded by a lipid envelope which is usually mostly derived from the host because virus they, uh, when they kind of hijack a cell or human cell, eukaryotic or prokaryotic cell, they uh, utilize their machinery for their benefit and they not only regenerate from it, but in the end they, they take away uh, their, that capsule from, from that cell, uh, just like a stolen thing from a house somebody is going to visit. So this uh, virus have a matrix protein, so matrix proteins, uh, that is most abundant on lipid bilayer and it connects basically the membrane of uh, uh, this virus to nucleic acid and because it has kind of two transmembrane domain and another domain that connects it to the nuclear material of the virus and from the outside world in a way. And this annular protein is important for the formation of these virus particles. And then there is another important protein that is called the spike protein uh, spike protein is important uh, and we are hearing a lot about the spike protein because most of the research that will lead into the vaccine development um, and virus infectivity, its entry into the cell is about that uh, spike protein because spike protein that has a globular upper part that is called the receptor binding domain and there is a lower part that has a, a fusion protein that, that helps uh, and this whole spike protein actually it helps the virus to latch on to human cell through a receptor on respiratory epithelium and other cells also uh, which are known as ACE2 angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors 
and basically it's a, a function of these uh, these two fusion and the receptor binding domains of the spike protein. So receptor binding protein RBD of SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-2, uh, SARS-CoV-1 and sorry SARS-CoV-2 have six critical amino acids and uh, that is necessary for its interaction with the ACE2 receptors and five of them uh, are different from SARS-CoV-2. So in a way it's not uh, that similar SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 are not that similar as we have expected and there is also a lot of uh, polybasically with site basically uh, that are effective cleavage site by many proteases. So that's uh, one advantage uh, or disadvantage, it could be a disadvantage to human cell but it's an advantage to virus replication and the expediency transmissibility of this virus. And that uh, specific polybasic uh, cleavage sites, they, they are amenable to uh, proteolytic uh, proteases like TRMP RSS2. Uh, and that has also been seen uh, together to that uh, fusion molecule that uh, that we usually see when the spike uh, receptors uh, latch onto the ACE2 receptor, and that's how the virus gains entry. So its genome is estimated to have 14 open reading frame. So it has a lot of open reading frame, and that basically encodes for about 27 proteins. So genome of this uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, it's, uh, it's a huge, huge genome with 30,000 uh, kb, uh, 30,000 kilobyte base pair. And viruses have been able to maintain such a big uh, genomic burden. Um, it's an unusual feature although. And there have been other varieties of viruses like uh, mini virus and mama virus and other varieties too that have uh, uh, large size uh, too, in addition to the uh, large size of genome. So the most important thing in this, uh, in its genome uh, uh, that encodes for 27 protein, the most important is the RDRP, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And it's usually not required uh, and it's usually transcribed from genomic RNA. Uh, directly for genomic sequences of non-structural proteins, while for other structural protein transcription in uh, the cell uses uh, these uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, cells, uh, the viruses, they use the discontinuous transcription uh, through a novel technique of shared transcription regulatory sequences, so uh, the TRS regions. So uh, there, is, there is a lot of polymerase jumping because of these uh, uh, the transcription regulatory sequences. What's going on is uh, 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 there is a lot of uh, uh, jumping of uh, uh, these uh, open reading frames, uh, these sequences, uh, uh, and uh, that actually creates uh, uh, that actually helps or creates uh, the mutational potential because of the frame shift. Uh, the thing that happens uh, during these uh, episodes because of these jumping episodes and that is a unique feature to this coronavirus. So we are going to talk about another important protein uh, that, is, that is called NSP1. So basically NSP1, a non-structural protein, uh, is the real factor for pathogenesis or pathogenicity of this virus and basically that acts through restricting host gene expression. So in a way uh, that protein is a shutoff mechanism for uh, the human uh, human cell for human cell genomic transcription, and it shuts off. It sends a shuts off message to uh, the cellular mechanism to stop making uh, proteins for its own use, and so that creates a broadly accelerated mRNA degradation in those cells. And by blocking those uh, ribosomal 40, 40S ribosomal units, and the virus uh, mediates uh, uh, endonucleolytic cleavage of these RNAs. So there is a lot of degradation of those uh, human mRNAs. So, 
uh, and that is very important in terms of uh, not just the pathogenesis or infectivity but it also delays uh, the response of human cells the response of uh, human cells in informing and asking for help to the interferon interferon mechanism so that is one reason for delayed interferon response in cases of covid-19 so there is a specific cleavage site of host rna and virus rna survive this nsp1 cleavage so most of the snippets or cleavaging is going on with the uh, human mrna and the virion mrna is going to survive it so it's going to keep on making its own proteins and its own things at the expense of uh, human cellular uh, genome or at the expense of human cellular protein and but this is so far the most important factor in virus survival as it's uh, blocking and delaying interferon response mutation of this nsp1 gene is a potential site for vaccine development strategy and scientists are working on this nsp1 gene if they could uh, mutate it probably uh, that could uh, give us a molecule and virus would not be able to suppress and delay the interferon response of human cell and that could even uh, add to less variety of disease and uh, early recovery so the virus is able to reach a high initial titers due to lack of or late interferon response and it causes an aberrant recruitment of uh, other pathogenic inflammatory monocyte macrophages responses and activation of innate immune responses that is leading to cytotoxicity and that is probably uh, the that probably leads to the cascade of events uh, causing acute lung injury and acute respiratory distress syndrome that is the hallmark of this disease so neutralizing antibody responses and memory b cell virus has uh, acquired a lot of new arsenal and um, and these responses are actually they are short lived on sars recovered patient it has been seen that the neutralizing antibody responses and memory b cells uh, responses are short lived on the people who survive from this covid disease so except for a few outlier population the immunity probably wanes with sars cov1 virus and with SARS-CoV-2 virus who are not really sure about uh, the extent of uh, immunity people uh, gain from uh, after clearing off this virus uh, it could be a month or it could be few months or it could last uh, a few years uh, we are not really sure and we are still learning so thank you very much for listening to this talk and today we had the occasion of recording this session from the comfort of my home actually it's my study room where i used to study uh, especially during the days of uh, mini fellowship uh, uh, with uh, that university of nebraska medical center with dr danish bhati uh, he has always inspired me um, so we're going to continue again on this topic uh, with a few more slides So thanks again and good night